In this video, I'll share with you the top three legal performance enhancers that are surprisingly affordable yet proven to be very effective. We'll look at some systematic reviews, meta-analysis, and studies demonstrating the efficacy of these enhancers. And we'll also discuss how these performance enhancers help us run faster along with any potential side effects that you should be mindful of. Conventionally, creatine is thought to be a supplement only for bodybuilders and powerlifters, but in fact, studies have shown that creatine highly benefits endurance athletes in a myriad of ways. Creatine has anti-catabolic effects that promotes faster recovery in aerobic endurance athletes. Long-duration aerobic activities such as running creates a temporary inflammatory environment in our bodies, releasing a lot of catabolic enzymes and hormones. Studies that looked into this showed that those who have taken creatine before an aerobic endurance activity had a huge reduction of those inflammatory enzymes and hormones compared to placebo. Thus, faster recovery after high-intensity workouts allows for more training sessions, within a given block, potentially leading to greater overall performance gains. Creatine also plays a crucial role in replenishing and maintaining ATP in muscles during moderate to high intensity exercise. ATP or adenosine triphosphate is the energy currency of every cell in our body. By enhancing muscle recovery while simultaneously delivering energy to muscle cells, creatine potentially allows us to increase training volume and improves our ability to sustain a higher performance output for longer periods. Additionally, creatine enhances the storage, mobilization, and utilization of glycogen within the muscles. Glycogen is a stored form of carbohydrates in muscle and liver cells, and it serves as a primary energy source during endurance and high-intensity exercise. There's advantages for a couple of reasons. When we can store more glycogen in our muscles, we can run further and faster before hitting the wall. Also, when more glycogen is stored in the muscles, less excess glucose remains in circulation, reducing the likelihood of it being converted to unwanted fat. A systematic review titled Anti-Inflammatory and Anti-Catabolic Effects of Creatine Supplementation provides evidence supporting the anti-inflammatory and anti-catabolic properties of creatine. The review indicates that creatine supplementation can decrease markers of inflammation and reduce muscle protein catabolism, which may aid in recovery for endurance athletes. Another review titled Creatine for Exercise and Sports Performance with Recovery Considerations for Healthy Populations discusses how creatine enhances ATP production, thereby improving energy availability during moderate to high intensity exercise. These enhancements can lead to increased training volume and sustain higher performance with reduced fatigue. There are about 10 forms of creatine sold by a plethora of retail brands across the globe. The retail brand of creatine is not important because most retail brands do not manufacture their own creatine. The most important thing to look for is the form of creatine. The gold standard is creatine monohydrate. The other thing to ensure is that a product has been third party or independently tested for purity and safety. Alternatively, look for a retail brand that uses a creatine monohydrate under the brand name Create Pure. Create Pure is a registered trademark brand of creatine monohydrate manufactured by by a company in Germany. CreatePure is not available for purchase by the end user, but on the CreatePure website, you will find a long list of retail brands that uses CreatePure creatine monohydrate in their products. It is typical for new creatine users to go through a loading phase of taking between 20 to 25 grams of creatine per day, divided into three to five doses for the first week. Well, the purpose for the loading phase is to rapidly saturate muscle with creatine, allowing users to experience its benefits sooner rather than waiting for gradual accumulation through lower daily doses. After the loading phase, a common maintenance dose is about 3 to 5 grams per day, but there seems to be more efficacy in supplementing according to your weight. In that case, a maintenance dose would be about 0.1 grams per kilogram per day. As an example, I'm about 65 kilograms and I consume 6.5 grams daily divided into two doses. Long-term studies confirm that creatine is completely safe in healthy individuals and the only side effect is minor bloating or weight gain due to increased water retention in muscles. The additional water weight is between 1-2% to of body weight. As an example, I might be carrying an additional 0.65-1.3 to kilograms of water because I weigh about 65 kilograms. For athletes concerned about their racing weight on race day, the associated water weight gain typically diminishes within a week when you stop taking creatine supplements. So if losing the final 1-2 to two kilograms of weight is important to you. Stop supplementing with creatine about a week before your major race. It's important to note that while water weight decreases, any muscle mass and strength gains achieved through training and creatine use are generally maintained provided you continue regular training and exercise. 
you might already expect this as caffeine is the world's favorite stimulant. Although caffeine is more conventionally thought of as a stimulant that keeps you awake, it can in fact also give you a serious age in sports. Caffeine acts on both the CNS, central nervous system, and muscles via different pathways and physiological mechanisms. Depending on the individual, caffeine can increase power output and performance anywhere between 0 to 17%, making it a very powerful legal performance enhancer for endurance athletes. Caffeine affects the central nervous system by blocking adenosine receptors in the brain, which delays the onset of fatigue and reduces the perception of effort. By doing so, caffeine allows runners to push harder for longer without feeling as exhausted. Additionally, caffeine stimulates the release release of dopamine and norepinephrine, which enhances focus, alertness, and motivation, which are key factors in sustaining high-intensity efforts during training and racing. In the muscles, caffeine enhances muscle contractions by increasing calcium release within the muscle cells. This extra calcium enhances muscle contraction by generating more movement and force, leading to stronger and more powerful contractions. It also makes muscles more responsive by lowering the effort needed for activation. Caffeine also improves motor unit recruitment, meaning more muscle fibers are engaged, leading to better endurance and efficiency during long runs and intense efforts. Furthermore, caffeine has an impact on our metabolism as it enhances the mobilization of free fatty acids from fat stores, allowing the body to utilize fat as an energy source more effectively. This process helps preserve glycogen stores in the muscles, which is crucial for pushing the wall back in long distance running. Finally, caffeine affects cardiac muscle contractions, improving the efficiency of the heart's ability to pump blood. It stimulates increased stroke volume, which is the amount of blood pumped per heartbeat and that leads to greater oxygen delivery to working muscles. By improving cardiac output, caffeine effectively boosts aerobic capacity, delaying muscle fatigue and supporting prolonged endurance efforts. A systematic review and meta-analysis published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine examined the effects of caffeine on aerobic endurance, muscle strength, and power output. The analysis concluded that caffeine ingestion is ergogenic for aerobic endurance, supporting its role as a performance enhancer for endurance athletes. Another meta-analysis published in Sports Medicine found that caffeine ingestion led to an improvement in endurance performance when consumed in moderate doses. This supports the notion that caffeine can enhance endurance by delaying fatigue and reducing perceived effort. Furthermore, another systematic review published in the Journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition reported that caffeine ingestion enhances muscle strength and power, which may be attributed to its effects on the central nervous system and muscle contraction efficiency. The optimal dose of caffeine is between 3 to 6 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. To find the optimal dose of caffeine that's right for you, you need to test this in training. Through testing, I found that my optimal dose of caffeine is about 4.5 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. At this amount, I feel the most ergogenic effect without feeling any symptoms of caffeine overdose. But when I go up to 6 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, I start to feel a bit dizzy and nauseous. Caffeine pills work better than coffee or any other caffeinated beverages because not only is it easier to control your caffeine dosage with pills, but research also shows that pure caffeine is more effective than coffee to boost performance. Caffeine levels in the bloodstream peak about one hour after consumption and it has a half-life of about four hours. So time it to experience the most ergogenic effect when it counts. High doses can cause jitters, increase heart rate, and gastrointestinal distress. Also, tolerance to caffeine also builds over time, so you may need to cycle your caffeine intake for the best results. What I typically do is I desensitize myself from caffeine for about a week before race day, which means that I do a caffeine fast for about 7 days leading up to an important race with the goal of being more sensitive to the ergogenic benefits of the caffeine on race day. And trust me, this works. In the US, it goes by the brand name Tylenol. For the rest of the world, it's Panadol. Yes, that's the same painkiller that you would take for a headache, but research suggests that it might help endurance athletes push their limits. In its conventional use, acetaminophen is widely recognized as a pain reliever and fever reducer, and it functions similarly in the context of running by dulling the pain perception and lowering body temperature. Acetaminophen works exclusively in the brain, influencing how we perceive pain and effort. Much of our ability to sustain high-intensity efforts during training and racing is dictated by how much discomfort we can tolerate. Acetaminophen reduces the brain's interpretation of pain, which in turn reduces the sensation of exertion. This allows us 
to push for longer before reaching what would normally feel like our physical limits. The other way acetaminophen may enhance performance is through its ability to lower core body temperature. When we run, especially in hot or humid conditions, our bodies struggle to dissipate heat efficiently. A rising core temperature increases cardiovascular strain, reduces neuromuscular efficiency and accelerates fatigue, which ultimately will lead to limiting performance. Studies have shown that acetaminophen can lower core body temperature during exercise and that helps runners maintain optimal function for longer periods. This effect is particularly beneficial during races in warm climates where overheating is a major performance limiter. Finally, acetaminophen blunts the body's natural fatigue signals. During prolonged training and racing, fatigue is regulated not just by energy depletion but also by signals from the brain designed to protect the body from overexertion. Acetaminophen interferes with these signals, meaning runners may not feel as exhausted as they actually are and this enables them to push beyond their usual endurance threshold. This is useful especially in later stages of a race where mental fatigue often becomes as challenging as physical fatigue. A systematic review and meta-analysis published in Sports Medicine examined the impact of acetaminophen ingestion on endurance performance. The analysis revealed that consuming acetaminophen 45 to 60 minutes before exercise can enhance performance in time to exhaustion tests, likely due to its pain-reducing properties which allow athletes to sustain efforts longer by diminishing discomfort. Another study published in Experimental Physiology looked at how acetaminophen's fever-reducing effects may influence exercise performance in hot conditions. It found that participants who ingested acetaminophen before cycling in a hot environment of 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit were able to exercise longer compared to a placebo group. This improvement was associated with significantly lower core, skin and body temperatures, suggesting that acetaminophen may reduce thermal strain during exercise by lowering body temperature. Furthermore, a research published in the Journal of Applied Physiology investigated acetaminophen's effect on cycling performance. The study concluded that acetaminophen ingestion improved performance during a 10-mile cycling time trial by increasing power output without altering perceived pain or exertion level. This suggests that acetaminophen may blunt the body's natural fatigue signals, allowing athletes to maintain a higher intensity without experiencing increased discomfort. 500 mg to 1000 mg of acetaminophen is the dosage range that has been commonly used in research studies and is considered effective for reducing pain perception, lowering core body temperature and delaying fatigue during endurance activities. As for timing, acetaminophen's effects peaks within 1 hour and lasts for about 4 to 6 hours. It is thus most effective when taken 45 to 60 minutes before the start of a race to allow sufficient time for the acetaminophen to be absorbed and take effect in the central nervous system. Acetaminophen is metabolized by the liver and in high doses exceeding 4,000 mg per day, it can lead to acute liver damage or even liver failure. This risk is amplified when combined with alcohol consumption or if it's taken for extended periods. Some individuals may also experience gastrointestinal discomfort, nausea or allergic reactions. For these reasons, acetaminophen may be something to take only on race day plus on a few race intensity efforts prior to the race day just to test how well it sits in your gut. From an endurance performance point of view, acetaminophen's ability to mask pain might lead to overexertion, increasing the risk of muscle strains, joint damage and other injuries by preventing the body from properly perceiving its limits. It's important to recognize that acetaminophen is a drug and depending on individual perspectives, its use in sports can be somewhat controversial to some people. That said, caffeine is also a drug that stimulates the central nervous system, yet it faces little to no controversy and creatine is a dietary supplement. Ultimately, the decision is yours to make on which ergogenic aids to use. I'm just putting it out there as an option for you. Altogether, creatine, caffeine, and acetaminophen are three legal, effective, and cheap performance enhancers that can help you run faster and their efficacy is backed by science. Just remember that the use of ergogenic aids is not meant to replace consistent training as that's the foundation of athletic performance. On that note, watching this video here will help you to run faster at a low heart rate. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video. Cheers.